Look with me in Galatians 5 then. And look at verse 13. He said, look at 12. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. Those are tough words for those false teachers who would come in. Paul said, I wish they were emasculated. I wish they were just cut off and had no word with you at all. But Paul is dealing with the conflict and the wake of the trouble those men brought. Verse 13, watch this. For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. That's a command. Apparently, these Galatians who in all their confusion had thrown off the good sound teaching about God's grace are now struggling even to love one another. Look at verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 15. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Isn't that a stark warning from the page of the Bible for saved people? Take heed. Listen to me. Hear what I'm telling you. And do what you should when you receive that truth. That's what take heed means. Because if you don't take heed of what I'm telling you, be careful. Because you're, you're on the track right now that you're going to obliterate one another. You are going to chew each other up and swallow. Isn't that sad? So Paul is concerned then for the Christian lifestyles of these confused believers who are leaving the grace of God clearly taught by Paul and embracing the false teaching of law brought by the troublemakers. Now with that small introduction, let's begin in Galatians 6 and verse 1. Brethren, stop right there. Is Paul writing this to save people or unsaved? Is Paul giving unsaved people a list of things they need to do to shore up their salvation case? Not at all. These are the brethren. Could it mean Jewish when he uses the word brethren? Does he mean Jews? No. It's a nice try, but it's just not true. This is a mixed crowd when he went into this region of Galatia. There were Jews in his audience. There were Gentiles too. He's not referring to Jews here. He's referring to believers in Galatians 6 verse 1. Here's what he says to them. If a man be overtaken in a fault. Stop right there. Is that possible? Is it possible that a saved person would be overtaken in a fault? Listen. If it were not possible for a saved person to be overtaken in a fault, Paul is writing nonsense. Would Paul take up a case and write a whole chapter and a half in the Bible about a hypothetical situation that's not possible? Of course not. It's entirely possible that a saved person would be overtaken in a fault. Now, we're not talking about what's desirable, are we? Obviously, we don't desire that this would be the case. We are not antinomian here who don't care about any standards or any obedience to the Lord flippantly accepting the grace of God while caring not at all about things like character and serving. No, no, we care about those things. It's just that we need to be very careful to not mix them into the gospel that calls us to the freedom of eternal life by grace through faith in Christ alone. Amen? Is that good? So Paul is, is concerned here that someone in the body here in Galatia is going to be overtaken in a fault. Isn't that what he wrote about in chapter 5, verse 15? And so he, he gives a command then to people who are not overtaken in a fault as believers, and he calls these people spiritual. So are we saying today that there are two kinds of believers? That there are some of those believers who are spiritual, and some of them in any given moment may be what? Not spiritual? Absolutely. That's exactly what we're saying here. Look back at chapter 5 again in verse 17. He says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Does that sound to you like a believer, saved person, could be controlled by his flesh? 
which is against the Spirit of God? Well, of course. And that's the whole background of the text here in chapter 5 and chapter 6. Paul is concerned that saved people will be living according to their flesh and not according to the Spirit that now they have because they're believers in Jesus. Are we clear then on the background here? So he says in Galatians 6, 1, if we have a person among us who is overtaken in a fault, you spiritual ones who are not overtaken in that fault have a job to do. Is that good? Is that good? So is the job of spiritual people to come upon this not spiritual person and kick them while they're down. Amen. Start rumors about them. Feature them in the Wednesday night prayer service. Tell everybody what their faults are so that we can pray one for another. That's what he said. He doesn't say it at all, does he? Well, what do they do? It says here, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So the case here is there is an overtaken, saved person. And he now finds that someone is reaching out to him. Trying to what? What's the word? Restore. Now some people will say, uh, this is nonsense. A saved person cannot be in that kind of non-spiritual life. Or else they're not saved. And I don't think I really need to defend the case here. All I need to do is read the Bible. Amen? Amen. What do we have here? We have brethren who are under command that if they have a brother among them who is overtaken in a fault, that they go and restore him. Listen, could you restore someone to a place they've never been before? This person who is not spiritual today is saved. He has walked with God. It's just that right now, he's not doing that. Why? Because he's overtaken in a fault. Is that possible? Well, now we already discussed that, didn't we? Of course it's possible. And that's what chapter 5 is about. It's possible for you. It's possible for me. That's why we ought to pray for one another, not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. Amen? That we ought to exhort one another while it's when? Still called today. And that as we see the day approaching, we do this more and more. Is the day approaching yet, y'all? And we need each other. Hmm? So there is a person who is saved but is not spiritual. Verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So these people think they're completing their salvation under the law and yet they're apparently not loving one another and not caring that they have brothers who are overtaken in sin. Are they fulfilling the law if that's their attitude? No. Verse 3, 4, if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Let me break verse 6 down. It's what Paul is saying. He's commending good teachers. And you might think, uh, when he wrote verse 6 that Paul is being selfish here, that he's a little arrogant. He's kind of putting himself under a spotlight or on a stump. I don't think he's doing that at all. I think Paul loves the truth so much he'll write it even when people think badly of him when he says it. I think verse 6 is probably the most disobeyed command in the New Testament. Let him that is taught, okay, in the word. What is that? Let's reduce that down. Let the Bible student. Could we say it that way? Let the Bible student do something. All right, skip the something right now. It's represented in this word communicate. But rather than try and figure out what that is right now, could we just say that what Paul is saying here is let the Bible student do something unto him that teaches. Okay, who is unto him that teaches? The Bible teacher. Okay, so simply he's saying let the Bible student do something to the Bible teacher. In all good things. So what he's saying is let the Bible student do something that has to do with all good things towards 
the Bible teacher. So what he's saying is communicate. What, what, what does it mean? How do we do that? What, what is Paul actually saying? He's saying, you who are learning God's word from good teaching, communicate to that teacher every good thing. And what he means is literally every good thing. Bless him, thank him, shake his hand. Write him notes. Bring the teacher an apple. That's what he's saying. Fix him financially. Bless him, honor him, because all are not sound. So when you get sound, make sure that the sound teacher has no occasion to say, ah, oh, it's just not worth it anymore. Honor that teacher, bless that teacher, let that teacher know, hey, I'm thankful for you, teacher, because you've brought it to me. Give him no occasion ever to become weary in the work that he's doing. Don't allow him to go to bed at night while still pondering the problems in his life brought on by unthankful people who have received the word of God but are not thankful from the place it came. Mm. And so he's saying, you have been taught well. But we know the backdrop, don't we? The fact is they have not communicated to Paul the Apostle in all good things lately. He's going to write in this book, what, what happened to you? When I was with you, knowing that my eyes were bad, you, you honored me, you communicated to me, you loved me so much, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. You honored me so, so well, but now have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And so they now apparently are honoring the false and not communicating to the true. And now verse 7, be not deceived. So we need to ask another question then. Is it possible that a saved person would be deceived. I think I could accurately tell you that if I believe the testimonies of all people who tell me they are saved, that I can accurately tell you that I know people in every category of sin who are saved, who've been deceived, who've done the wrong thing, who've done the wrong thing because they believed the wrong thing. And their action followed their belief. Sure, a saved person could be deceived. And if we think that a saved person will automatically always obey the truth, we ourselves have been <laughs> deceived. Because what do we have here? Paul the Apostle just pleading with saved people who have been deceived. And he's afraid will continue to be deceived and they have a lot to lose if they continue in that track. Verse 7 then, he says, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Let's talk about this. There I was down in the garden spot. Now we had our home. We had about a half an acre of grass. And then there was a terrace that had been formed by my grandfather with his mule and stone boat. And below that terrace was the garden spot. That was the wettest piece of ground we had. And so that's where Daddy decided to plow. And after the ground was broken up, my Daddy told me, Freddie, need you to help me plant it today. Now we had problems already with this arrangement because my brother was out in the front yard I'm below the terrace. He's in the front yard. He's hosting his buddies in a big old game out there in the front yard. Little Joseph, I mean Freddie, is down there in the swamp with a sack of beans in his hand. Daddy, there is no fairness in life. I was five years younger than my brother. 
Yes, he's the same brother who told me that that big old cattail stalk was a chocolate popsicle. And I got a mouthful of it. Now he's hosting his friends in the big ball game in the front yard while I have a sack full of beans. And daddy went along and he dug all the little holes. We're going to make here a hill of beans. Did your daddy ever say you're not worth a, a hill of beans? You didn't know what it was? That's where they plant a bean plant. It's called a hill. And I made a bunch of them that day. My daddy dug the holes. He put the fertilizer, the guanner, he called it. In the hole. You've been there, haven't you? And then he handed me the sack and he said, Freddie, three beans in each hole. I could hear them up in the front yard. Oh boy, it looked, seemed like that was a good game going on. Somebody's hollering. Somebody's happy. They're laughing up there. There's nothing funny about my bean sack. Three beans in each hole and then cover them up. So there I go. I'm counting them out. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. <clears throat> One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. Shake my sack. It's a little lower than it was a minute ago. One, two, three. <clears throat> One, two, three, four, five, six. The farther I got down that row, the closer I got to the edge of the low spot, the closer I got to the edge of that long curvy row, the more of those beans found their way into each hole. What I'm telling you is by the end of that row, I'm ready to shake out the bag because we finally got them planted. Amen. Now the job is done because... Daddy, I, <laughs> I planted the beans. Can I go play now? And so Paul the Apostle, when he gets to verse 7, is talking about planting something. He's talking about planting and harvesting. He's talking about sowing and reaping. And if you haven't been raised around farms, then here's a great place in the Bible that we accept the truth that the Bible is an agricultural book. The Bible is written by outdoorsy people. Okay, and it's written to outdoorsy people about outdoorsy things. So the more we get outdoors, the more we understand about agricultural countryside kinds of things, the more we stand to understand of the illustrations in Scripture. Is that good? Is that good? So if you've been around the bean plant, you understand what Paul is trying to say here. And he puts the analogy to good use. He's telling them, look, Galatians, you who have believed in Jesus now have life. You have life and you have teaching coming to you. You have received great teaching. Now it's time to put it to use. And metaphorically, he's telling them, make sure that the function of all that you've been taught about spiritual truth causes you to plant the right kinds of seed. Because what do we know about seed? The beans come up. And so far, these believers lately are apparently going under the law and they are sowing the wrong kind of beans. Is that possible for a saved person? It's possible. And in fact, it's likely if you get them under the wrong kind of teacher. And so there, there is where Paul the Apostle is living with these people. And so he now puts his hope into convincing them under the law of the harvest. Let's look a little deeper at this. Be not deceived, he said. God is not mocked. Now here's where we need to go in and look at this word mocked. Because... Isn't that a question mark? What do you mean God is not mocked? They mocked Jesus Christ, remember? When he was lined up and the scourge was fresh and they mocked him, they pulled on his beard, they slapped him in the face. 
You remember Herod was upset. He felt he had been mocked by the wise men who came. Remember that? So this word mocked is a Bible word. But what does it mean when it says God is not mocked? Didn't they mock Jesus? So let's put this in its complete context here. When Paul the Apostle says God is not mocked, you might think of it this way. Now this word means to disrespect someone, to sneer at them, to look down on someone as though they have no authority over you. So picture that there's a bad guy, he's robbed a bank, shot up a store or something, he's on the run now, and he crosses the state line. Or we might, if you want to think of uh, the old western or something, he, he goes across the river, gets into Mexico, and turns around and sneers at the law, the authority that's been trying to pursue him, trying to apprehend him. And he mocks them in that he sneers at them. He looks down on them and he says essentially, I got away with it. You thought you could catch me. But I have done what you didn't want me to do. I have broken the law, but I am right in the end and you can't touch me now. Neener, neener, neener. It's that idea. And Paul the Apostle says... You cannot rightly mock God in your behavior. Why? Well, that's what he's writing about. So it's in that sense that God is not mocked. No one will ever get away with sin. You don't get away with that. A very frequent question asked of me is, can a saved person live any way they want to? The answer is yes. Yes. In fact, right now to use you personally as an example, you are right now living exactly as you have chosen. Every single person in the sound of my voice is exactly, precisely as close to God as you have chosen to be. We can live any way we want to. But God is not mocked. No one has gotten away with anything. No one has done misbehavior, disobedience outside of the eyesight of God who holds the future in his hand. That's the message of verse 7. And so he says then that God is not mocked, and then he adds, because for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now here are the laws of the harvest. I'll give you three of them. Number one, you reap what you sow. Isn't that true? If you go and sow corn... Guess what kind of harvest you'll get when the harvest comes in? It won't be tomatoes, will it? It'll be corn. You reap what you sow. Number two, you reap more than you sow. The Bible says you put one kernel of corn into the ground. And what happened? It goes into the ground, dies, and then miraculously under the law of creation... It takes on life again, and up comes the corn plant. And from that corn plant come many, many more kernels of corn. And it's really good with butter slathered over it, amen? So you reap what you sow, and you reap more than you sow. Do you see the point we're driving towards? You better check what's in the bag of those seeds. Because if you're going to reap the same thing that's in your bag that's going into the holes placed by your hand, better check those seeds. Make sure they're what? The kind of seeds that you want to harvest one day. Because you reap what you sow and you reap more than you sow. And law number three, you reap later than you sow. It's so easy when you plant something, just cover that seed up and forget all about it. Um, have you been there? 
Put a few extra in each hole and you'll, you'll run out of seeds in that bag and you can go play some ball then. It's so easy just to forget what went in the ground because the law of the harvest says they don't come up, they don't bear fruit. The harvest doesn't come until later after the sowing is done. Verse 8, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So in verse number 8 then, we have two kinds of seed. Flesh seeds and spirit seeds. You follow this, don't you? It's, it's so simple. Once Paul locks down this agricultural illustration, for anyone who's ever planted a hill of beans, now we can get spiritual truth that comes from that agricultural illustration. So there are two kinds of seeds. There's flesh seed and there's spirit seed. So let's say that you sow flesh seed. You are going to harvest flesh. Let's say that you sow flesh seeds, okay? You're going to reap more flesh seed than you sowed. And you're going to reap what flesh seeds bring later than when you sowed. It won't happen in the day. It'll happen later. So he warns then, make sure then that you're sowing spiritual seed. I have two questions. Number one, what is corruption? He says, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Corruption means loss, destruction. A saved person who sows seeds out of his flesh bag is going to have a harvest of, the word is corruption, loss and destruction. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about a future harvest. Now, listen carefully. It's very easy and also very practical to teach Galatians chapter 6 in a here and now scenario. And we can, we can practically apply it in that way. After all, don't we all know people here and now who have made unwise decisions who almost immediately began to reap badly from it? Hmm? But Paul is not talking in a here and now scenario here. It may apply. It may practically hold true that you go and, you go and put things into your body... And there are going to be almost immediate bad consequences. But Paul is not writing about the immediate consequences that bad decision making in the flesh brings. He's talking about a later harvest. That's what he's referring to. You remember 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and the passage of the judgment seat of Christ? Let's go there quickly. 1 Corinthians and chapter 3. This ought to be marked in your Bible. This is the most complete passage in the Bible that describes this event that saved people are headed towards. It's a judgment of what saved people did with the opportunities they had in what we call the Christian life. I want you to pick this up here, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 3, 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So the key word about this judgment in front of Jesus Christ is what? Work. Work. Work is being examined here. So can we conclude that this is a judgment to see who is saved? No. Because saved is not determined by work, is it? Now, this is where you ought to get all excited and start shouting amen and stuff. You ought to be standing on your head out there saying, that's right, and waving your legs around. Yeah, this obviously, this is not a judgment to see who is saved or not. It's a judgment to see who, uh, what saved person will be rewarded because of the service they gave to the Lord the things they built with the lives they had. Amen? But look with me at verse 14. He says, If any man's work abide which he had built thereupon, he shall receive a, a reward. 
reward. So it sounds like in verse 14, that's, that's a good harvest, amen? Somebody went out there and sowed some spiritual seed in the ground, and they reaped some spiritual harvest. And they reaped more spiritual seed than they ever sowed. And they reaped it later. Here is later, the judgment seed of Christ. And buddy, somebody is, woo-wee, mama, look what we planted. And look, mama, the harvest has come in today. Oh, baby, I'm glad we sowed the way we sowed. Mama, the beans have come up. And look what we get from God But then there's verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So here's a saved person who for all we know, evidently and apparently here, has sown corrupt seed from the bag of the flesh. He sowed the flesh, he's now harvesting the flesh. He sowed some flesh, he's now reaping more of the flesh. He sowed then, but now the delayed harvest has come in. Does it sound like the people in verse 15 are happy? Not at all. Is there a person then who is saved today and not rewarded? Do you mean they did not do a thing? That God will reward in that day? Hey, I'm just reading the Bible. Somebody suffers loss. It's not loss of salvation, is it? Because he says they're saved, yet so is by fire. They're saved, but not rewarded. Someone should take heed to Galatians chapter 6. Could it be there's a saved person in the sound of this teaching? But sowing today from a bag of the flesh, the warning goes out, a threefold warning. You're going to reap it. And you'll reap more of it than you ever planted. And you'll reap it later. Back to Galatians chapter 6. Let's finish it off here. Verse number 9. He says, And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. The last two words in verse number 8 life everlasting cannot be referring simply to a spot in heaven okay sometimes uh, teachers can be guilty of not allowing this phrase life everlasting or everlasting life or eternal life to allow it to be a broad word and applied broadly Jesus Christ in John 17, 3 said, This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So to him in that sense, eternal life simply means God and I are together in fellowship. Eternal life here in Galatians chapter 6 is referring to future reward. Future reward. This is the enjoyment of of all the good things God has for people who did not grow weary and stop planting, but they continued to plant from the spirit bag. And because they sowed spiritually, they'll reap spiritually. Is that good? Is that good? But don't try and make this a heaven and hell. At any place in Galatians chapter 6, you try and make it a heaven or hell issue, and you'll lose the context. In the context, this is about a later harvest. It's all about a later harvest. When we compare Scripture with Scripture, compare this with 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and you find a loser there and a loser here. And so Paul gives a a final word on this in verse 9. Don't be weary. If you're sowing spiritual seeds, don't grow weary and stop. Don't stop because you're tired. Don't stop because you're alone in the bean field and everybody else is out there playing ball. Amen. Will you encourage me in my young life? Will you talk to me? Will you speak wisdom into my ears when I was holding that bean sack on that hot day? Down in the low spot. What would you tell me? Freddie, keep putting the seeds in the ground. You can play ball tomorrow. 
But when you get the word from your father, he knows best. Will you say with me, father knows best. A father knows best. So you just, Freddie, would you speak it to me? Freddie, keep sowing. Put the beans in the ground, three in each hole. But there I was, weeks later, walking down my bean rows. There's three, they're mine. There's three more. Look at there, Daddy. There's three in the next hole, doing well. Ooh, what a good bean planter I am. Mm, there's four in that hole. <clears throat> Look at the next one, Daddy. There's six in that one. By the, time, <laughs> by the time I got to the end of that row, I'm walking in a forest of beans. Because the beans come up. And don't they always? And these spiritual beings that we have the ability to sow, Paul the Apostle said, don't stop. The culture may be going the wrong way, but you keep planting. It may be hot outside. Conditions may not be perfect. Put the beans in the hole, just like the Father said. There's a reward coming for those who sow the seeds and keep on going. Amen. Now, it could be that you are not certain that you and God are together. Let me be clear about this. Would you let that hand represent you? And let my wallet represent your sin. Now, you're just like I am. You and I both have sin. There we are. There's our sin. Let that be God. He has no sin. He holds heaven. He is eternal God. He would love for you to be there, but you have a problem. It's sin. That sin is a barrier between you and God. God has done something about it. You never could. As long as you're trying to be saved, you're not saved. Okay? If you're trying to get rid of the sin, you're depending on your flesh because that's all you have. You don't have spirit life yet. It's just you and the flesh. But look what God has done. God took on flesh. Jesus came right down to our level because he loves us all day long and Jesus Christ took our sin, bore it in his own body at the cross. Is that the kind of friend that you need in these days in your life? One who'll come like that, love you at your worst and love you more than anyone else and do the very thing that would cost him his own life so that you could have life with God. So when Jesus died on the cross, it was for you. It was for your sin, and he paid it all, paid every sin of your whole life, and rose again from the dead without your sin. Watch this. So now there are you and God. Did you know that Jesus Christ reconciled the world to himself? There is no sin barrier now. But you need to believe in him, and you will have everlasting life. It's given as a gift. It's absolutely free. You see, you don't, you don't have to stop doing all the sins that you're doing. You don't have to start doing all the right things. Listen, friend, we know this would be impossible. This is what Christian life is all about, learning, growing, doing. But in order to be saved into eternal life, you simply need to be born. And the way that you're born is by believing in Christ. And God will so gladly put you in his family forever, for keeps. Would you believe in him right now if never?